I'll, I'll start with sort of just uh, briefly overviewing how we go about testing general relativity um, using gravitational wave observations of binary black hole mergers. And essentially, there, there are two broad approaches that one can take. Uh, one is so-called self-consistency tests within general relativity. So not having any particular alternative theory or modified black hole model in mind, um, but just using um, general relativity itself. And then, of course, the other approach is if we did have some particular modification or exotic compact object in mind, if we could come up with predictions of the waveforms, we could confront that with the data and contrast it with general relativity to try to um, either test general relativity or the flip side of this, <laughs> this talk would be to try to discover new physics in black hole mergers using gravitational wave observations. So mo most of the talk, I'm going to focus on the sort of second um, aspect of it or trying to go beyond so-called self-consistency tests. And of course, then we need alternative and modified theories. Um, and there are actually many, many suggestions for how you might modify gravity or count with exotic uh, alternatives to black holes. And many of these theories have, um, do have predictions for the, for the perturbative uh, aspects of the, the merger problem. So that's either in the early in spiral, uh, where various uh, modifications to the post-Newtonian expansion have been uh, developed, or if black hole solutions are known, are known in these modified theories in the ring down regime, where again, perturbative uh, techniques can be applied. So I'll argue, I guess somewhat provocatively, that um, there are no interesting viable proposals, almost no interesting viable proposals to date that have been applied to the non-perturbative phase of merger. That's sort of where the black holes coalesce, which is perhaps arguably the most interesting part of the merger phenomenon and where the most obvious deviations from relativity should be apparent if they're, if they're present. And I'll... And I'll explain very carefully what I mean by interesting and viable, not to offend too many people uh, when I get there, hopefully. Now, in my abstract, I said I'd mention uh, a couple of examples, one in einstein dilaton gauss bonnet gravity, and the other one, these ADS black bubbles. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm actually not going to say much about EBGB gravity. And one reason is I noticed that Paul Figueres is going to be talking about that tomorrow. So I think he's going to be covering that. Um, the one example that I will focus on a little bit is. Um, a so-called black hole mimicker was something that is an ultra compact object that looks like a black hole, but it's not a black hole. And it's this one idea called an ADS black bubble. Okay, so you know, over the, you know, essentially since the seventies, um, evidence has been building um, and it's become almost incontrovertible today that there are regions of our universe where there are ultra compact dark concentrations of energy so compact, in fact, that if relativity is the correct description, then they must be black holes. Um, so it begins here on the left, you know, the Cygnus X1 being discovered in the early 70s. And of course, um, very recently, well, the, the, the orbits around Sagittarius A star is one of the prime examples of this of very strong evidence that's been gathered. And it's been gathered, gathered for decades by Gensel and Geza's group. But I guess, as everyone knows, last year, um, they were co-awarded the Nobel Prize with Roger Penrose for their discovery of this ultra compact object in the center of our galaxy. Um, now, also, you know, very recently, well, actually much more recently, you know, LIGO has ushered in the, the era of observational um, strong field gravity um, with, with detections now of many candidate uh, binary black hole mergers, um, at least one binary neutron star merger, and the, the difference with, with the LIGO observations, and that's what I'm going to focus on with these gravitational wave observations, is that actually now it's not so much that we can say we see these signals, if general relativity is correct, they binary black holes with certain properties. But there's actually enough information in these signals that we can actually start quantifying consistency with the, 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 if you will, the, the Kerr hypothesis, the general relativity hypothesis that these are Kerr black holes that are colliding and forming other Kerr black holes. So as I mentioned, there's sort of two broad classes of, of ways in which you can test it. One is self-consistency tests within relativity. And essentially, the reason why this works and works so well in relativity are the uniqueness properties of, of black holes, or, or perhaps a different way of posing it is in, or stating this is in terms of this final state conjecture uh, formulated by Penrose in the 60s. So I guess many researchers at the time were coming to the same kind of conclusion, but this is kind of a, 
uh, a, way, uh, a way of formulating it that Penrose suggested. And it's this final state conjecture is saying, well, let's look at Einstein gravity with initial data that doesn't contain naked singularities in an asymptotically flat space time. There can be very co strong concentrations of gravitational energy. They can form black holes. The question is, what is the final state? What does this eventually evolve to? And Penrose conjectures, well, once everything has settled down, um, that you're going to be left with a series of unbound black holes moving apart with radiation streaming away to, to null infinity. But moreover, each one of these unbound black holes is locally an asymptote to a single member of the Kerr uh, family of solutions. Um, this conjecture, when restricted to single black holes, is sometimes referred to as a nonlinear stability of Kerr or the conjectured nonlinear stability that um, there's been a lot of. Um, the rapid progress recently in proving this, and I suspect there'll be quite a few talks at this conference about that. Um, sometimes this is sort of test, this is often called the testing the no-hair theorems of, of relativity. Um, but just to, to, to emphasize the obvious, when we're looking at gravitational wave observations um, to test this uniqueness property, they aren't stationary isolated black holes. Otherwise, they wouldn't be emitting gravitational waves. So the no hair theorems are a very important part of the final state conjecture, but they deal with stationary space times. So we really are testing um, sort of the dynamics of, 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 of general relativity by looking at um, uh, binary black hole mergers. And of course, you might immediately object and saying, well, the universe is in a vacuum asymptotically if that's space time. And you know, that is a correct uh, or, uh, argument, but then um, how we're going to use this is we're going to assume, and it might be a reasonable assumption, you know, it seems, at least the evidence so far suggests that it's a reasonable assumption that the, the stellar mass black hole mergers that LIGO are, are, is seeing is very likely in an environment with a circumbinary matter um, or the effect of cosmic um, acceleration, the fact that the universe isn't asymptotically flat, is completely negligible on the waveform, that it's, that it's a very negligible perturbation. Okay, so a couple of examples of the self-consistency test. One is a so-called residuals test. Um, and the best single black hole example of that is still the first one that LIGO detected, BW150914. And essentially what is, what is being illustrated here is the LIGO, the, the two observ observatories have this data. They, they do their match filtering. They search for the best fit a relativity template. They subtract that from the data. And that's sort of what's shown here in this this, the bottommost panel of this figure, and the leftover um, is consistent with noise. So the residual after uh, subtracting out the, the best fit uh, template is consistent with noise. Um, and so you know, perhaps they're getting, getting, connecting this with a final state conjecture while they'll say, okay, so certainly that's fine. That means that this is a consistent interpretation. But imagine what if, what if some residual is ever discovered? Why could you kind of, if, if, are you confident that it's an astrophysical uh, source that's not noise? So you discover an, a residual. Why would you be confident to say that this must be some kind of a modification to general relativity um, and not perhaps some novel black hole where we don't have templates for it yet? And of course, the answer is the final state conjecture um, in relativity, that there are no other options. If we've covered our parameter space with a with a merger of two black holes and the corresponding waveforms, there are no other structures that we should see that this, that this it's you know, not a very high dimensional parameter space in terms of you know, possibility. So if we've covered that, these are the only kinds of signals that we should see. And of course, the caveat is perhaps there's some unusual circumbinary environment that we haven't seen. But in any case, barring that, um, it's really that we can make such a strong statement is because of the final state conjecture. Another example that, that LIGO has also um, done other than residuals is, um, is sort of consistency between different parts of the waveform. Um, and so one, one, one consequence of the final state conjecture for understanding the physics of black holes using gravitational wave observations is unfortunately, we're not gonna learn anything new about the physics of black holes with ever more detections or ever higher signal to noise ratios. And we'll definitely learn about the astrophysics of black holes, their populations, et cetera. But if the only kinds of black holes out there are curved black holes, we pretty much know everything already. Um, so that, that's a bit unfortunate for learning anything new about the physics of curved black holes. Um, 
On the other hand, how we can then use this to test relativity. So you imagine a very high signal to noise ratio detection that Bigo eventually makes. That implies there's a lot of information in that signal. But if the final state conjecture is correct, there are really just very few parameters in general relativity that actually control that complicated signal. And therefore, there must be a lot of redundant information. And so, for example, here with this in spiral ring down comparison, by looking at the in spiral only part of the waveform, an estimate can be made of uh, the properties of the progenitor black holes, the two black holes that are about to merge. And then using that, we can uniquely predict using general relativity what the final mass and spin of the remnant must be. Then independently, you can look at the, the ring down portion of the wavelength, I'm oh, sorry, of the waveform. Um, and based on the, the decay frequencies and uh, sorry, the, the, the oscillation frequencies and decay constants of those waves, you can again map that to the mass and the spin of the final uh, curved black hole, and they better be consistent. And that's what this plot uh, here sort of indicates is these two different measurements of the, the difference in the spin or the mass from the GR prediction from two different parts of the waveform, and they're consistent. And so, for example, with the ring down, in particular, you can imagine the more uh, independent quasi-normal modes that can be measured, the more sort of independent estimates of the final mass and spin you can make. And if, of course, if general relativity is correct, they're all going to give the same answer at the end of the day. And in fact, recently, the, there has been a claim that, in fact, the, the first um, overtone of the leading order quadrupole mode is also observable in this data. So um, that there is already, so this is what I mean by quanti quant quantitative evidence that general relativity is correct, and these are uh, curved black holes colliding. So, okay, but most of what I want to focus on here is, okay, going beyond these self-consistency tests. So, so how would we, uh, well, well, why would might we want to do that? Well, I think what these self-consistency tests have already shown us is that in this dynamical strong field regime where black holes live, general relativity can't be completely wrong. Um, it's mostly got it right. So if there is something that's wrong or there's something new or something interesting going on there that we don't know about, it's got to be a subtle effect. Um, and so one perhaps problem with the consistency test is it's not the most sensitive way of digging into the data to try to find those uh, subtle effects. Um, and in particular, for example, like subtle effects that might be traded off with parameter bias. But then another reason to perhaps look at like how waveforms in principle could be different is, you know, the other side of the, the testing GR coin is, let's look for something new. Perhaps what if something new is discovered? How can we interpret what it is? If we just had uh, a residual, we told us that something's wrong. Well, what does it point to? What physics does it point to? What structures around the black hole might it point to, um, to tell us what's going on? Um, I think to, to answer those questions, you really need to be able to understand, well, how could things be different if relativity was wrong? And that could be one, one of the motivations for trying to go beyond these self-consistency tests. So as I mentioned in, in, in the outline, there, there are many alternative uh, uh, theories out there or modifications to compact object or alternative to compact objects. And for many of them in the early in spiral, uh, the effects on the post newtonian expansions have been computed. And so these theories have already started to be constrained by the LIGO observations. Um, some of these theories have modified black hole solutions, which modifies the ring down. So they can also um, sort of confront the data with, with their ring down predictions. But at the moment, there's no, there's no concrete prediction for a modified theory in the merger regime. So what are we missing um, by not looking at the actual merger uh, part, of the, part of the signal? And one, one is just a simple reduction in effective signal to noise. There's a lot of the signal that is, we can't use to come up with tighter constraints uh, of, of, of relativity, which I'll sort of illustrate in the next couple of slides. But then even though you can imagine that, that many kinds of corrections or modifications to relativity will affect the entire signal. So it sh you should be able to pick it up with a loud enough event, event, even if you can only look at the in spiral. But there are some examples um, for example, perhaps the most uh, famous is a so-called dynamical scalarization in certain scale intensive theories. And this will only be relevant for binary neutron stars. But this is an example where you largely won't see it through most of the in spiral and it will almost step function like turn on at a point very close to merger. So there are certain kinds of 
at least conceivable modifications where it might only be visible at uh, in the merger phase. But getting to just perhaps the, 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 the more simple example of what are we missing by ignoring the merger? So here's another sort of plot of the, the first gravitational wave signal that LIGO observed, the 150914, showing the, the signal from the three detectors plus a numerical relativity waveform that's been sort of uh, filtered through the, the LIGO noise spectrum. So you can see the in spiral part, here's the merger part, there's the ring down. Um, and so you know, just, just by eye, you can see that most of the signal is sort of the, lo the loudest part of the signal is coming from the merger regime. And if you think, well, I'm sort of interested in, in understanding strong field dynamical gravity, and it's actually the late in spiral is strong field dynamical gravity, particularly in, in, in terms of the waveform. And just as to illustrate, so this, this is the actual signal if it weren't filtered through the LIGO noise. So if LIGO had a flat, had a flat sensitivity spectrum um, that was at equal sensitivity to all frequency bands, you'd see that there's actually a strong signal in the end spiral. But for these, these more massive, uh, like 20, 30, 40 solar mass black holes, most of, of the low frequency part of the signal is LIGO is not very sensitive to. And so there's just a selection effect based on the properties of the detector. That means that it's really zooming in on this, this, this merger phase. So both because of the, the nature of the detector um, and the kinds of black holes that we are seeing, we're actually, most of the signal is coming from this merger phase. So that's really where we want to be digging into the data to test relativity or discover something novel. Okay, that, that gets us then, well, well why, why don't we have to dig in this non-perturbative regime? And, and that, that's where I sort of said, I would argue that at present, there are really no interesting viable modified gravity theories um, that are applicable to the merger phase. Um, and I'm not like, I like this illustration because this, this Kip Thorne is not working on modified gravities, gravity, but this is a, a slide that he came up with in the late 90s, um, where at the time we didn't understand the merger phase in general relativity. And so this was his um, sort of argument for why we had to understand that to be able to interpret and detect eventual LIGO detections. And of course, he was, he was wildly optimistic with how interesting the merger regime in, in terms of the waveform structure it would be in general relativity. It's turned out to be a lot simpler. But the, the, the point is at the moment, we, we, we're in the same boat for any alternative theory other than general relativity. Okay, so let me just quantify what I mean by interesting and viable, because many people might want to object. And so let me just say what I mean, mean in this case. So I'm going to call a modified gravity theory interesting if it's consistent with current weak field tests and constraints, so solar system tests, the binary pulsar, et cetera. So it's not immediately ruled out by existing tests of gravity. Yet in principle, it could have uh, differences in the strong field that should be seen by LIGO in the merger phase. So that, that, that in my definition of the word is, is an interesting modified gravity theory. Um, I'm going to call a modified gravity viable um, if it possesses a well-posed initial value formulation. So if it can't make predictions for what should happen in the merger regime, doesn't matter how interesting it is, it's not viable. So that's what I mean by these words. Um, and so and, and just also to just give another motivation for why I'm kind of interested in this, in this problem. Um, in particular, like as of now, there's no reason to suspect that the general relativity description um, is, not, is not valid for, for stellar mass binary black hole mergers, but it's just one of theoretical curiosity. Um, if you think of a classical metric theory of gravity, what are the possible black hole-like solutions that it has and what are the possible dynamics that it could have? Um, and perhaps by analogy, you could ask the same question for a metric theory of gravity. Um, what are the possible propagating degrees of freedom in weak field, in the weak field? And in that case, we know what the answer is, that there are six propagating degrees of freedom in general. And so in that case, relativity is actually a very restricted class of geometric theories in that it only allows the plus and the cross polarization. So then the puzzle is, well, or, or perhaps, it's, perhaps it's not a puzzle, but why haven't people been able to answer or even start to answer this question for modified gravity theories in the strong field regime? Or perhaps it is that somehow there's something unusual that happens with metric theories of gravity where 
they kind of uniquely predict that the strong field is curved black holes. But that, that's, that's, that's I mean, an interesting question to try to answer is like, what, what can possibly happen in the strong field for generic theories? Okay, so how do you, how do you modify gravity? Um, and this is just, just a, sort of a, a broad sort of a schematic outline. Well, you can either modify the left-hand side or the right-hand side, um, the geometry, if you will, on the left-hand side or the matter on the right-hand side. In some sense, you can flip, you know, you can, you can exchange the modifications between them one way or the other. So what you might call modified geometry, you can recast as modified matter, et cetera. Um, but is it essentially that these are the kinds of ways to think about how you could modify gravity. And usually if it's modified on the right-hand side, or if that's where most of it comes from, you might have think of them as exotic alternatives to black holes, perhaps not alternatives to black holes, but new classes of exotic compact objects. So how you modify the geometry, and this is what I'm, I've just got essentially one slide on this. I'm not going to be talking about this anymore, but just as an illustration. So typically, how people suggest one modifies geometry is at the level of the action. So consider all possible curvature scalars that you might add to the action and see how, um, what are the consequent theories that you get. And the, the problem with this approach is that um, there are really only two curvature scalars, the Einstein-Hilbert scalar or the Ricci scalar and the Gauss-Bonnet scalar, that when you vary the action, you get equations of motion that have at most second derivatives. Um, now, both for mathematical and physical reasons, if you go beyond second derivatives, you typically have ill posed problems, which is, and perhaps that's one answer why relativity is kind of unique in the strong field regime, is that trying to, uh, just unique in general, is that, that there really only are two unique scalars that give you second order equations of motion. And in fact, the gauss bonnet scalar in four dimensions is actually a total derivative. So by itself, it doesn't affect the equations of motion. So in four dimensions, there is one unique geometric scalar, the Ricci scalar. Um, on the other hand, how you get Einstein's little on gauss bonnet gravity is if the coupling to this gauss bonnet scalar, if you make it a scalar field, if you even introduce an extra dynamical degree of freedom, then this total derivative property is broken. And you can actually have an interesting modified gravity theory in four dimensions. And that's this Einstein's little on gauss bonnet gravity. So I'm not going to be talking about that anymore. Um, I think Powell is going to talk about that tomorrow. So, so now the other side is uh, looking at modified matter um, and so-called exotic alternative to black holes. Um, I, you know, I think that perhaps the only, I mean, arguably the only interesting viable example right now, I would say would be boson stars or some of these black holes with ultralight particle hair. Um, but in particular, boson stars, they're actually not alternatives to black holes. They're just new classes of exotic compact object that might exist. But on the, on, the, on the side of, I think, very interesting suggestions for alternatives, things like traversable wormholes, gravistars, fuzzballs, et cetera, at present, there are none of them that have really sufficiently concrete theories behind them that we can actually make predictions or even ask if they are well-posed ideas, whether they're physically stable, or whether there's some mathematically well-posed theory. So they're kind of at the level of ideas. Um, nevertheless, people have suggested that there are possibly interesting consequences, even though they don't, we don't know the dynamics of these objects. So as for example, one of them is that if there are compact objects that don't have horizons, the expectation is that the, the ring down signal will exhibit these, these echoes. Um, on the other hand, with comparable mass mergers, and I'm very skeptical about these kinds of predictions um, because the, these calculations are taken by looking at a stationary object and then usually just a point particle plunging into it or some kind of a perturbation. And that's very, very different from the kind of excitation that might happen by a comparable mass merger. Um, and so just as a cartoonish sort of case in point, just imagine we had traversable wormholes and ask, well, what's it going to look like when two of them merge? Well, with traversable wormholes, in principle, you could have this kind of topology. So this, this top sheet would be what we see in our universe. There are these two wormholes to other universes or other pieces of our universe, and they merge. Well, topologically, how is this thing going to settle down to a single traversable wormhole? Why is this not a logical possibility for the end state that there's now this multi-wormhole structure where you can choose which branch you want to go through? And if that happened, why on earth would the 
the ring down, or the echo looks something like what you'd see through a single wormhole. And so of course, that's, I mean, I just made up this example, but this is a, the kind of thing where um, I think these, these exotic ideas are interesting, but if they can't make predictions, it's, it's questionable how useful some of these, um, the, the, these statements are. Okay, so that, and that, give, that big brings me to the last part of the talk to, um, to trying to start to address this question, or, or at least trying to put some theory behind some of these ideas so that we can come up with, co with concrete predictions, either to rule them out or perhaps discover something interesting. And so the, the one, it, it, this is focusing on one of these exotic alternatives to black holes. And this, this one um, actually does, I think, have a well-posed uh, initial value problem. And these are the so-called ADS black bubbles that was proposed by Danielson, De Vitito, and Giri several years ago. Um, they conjectured that these are solutions to string theory. They, the, the, the equations are, I, mean, I don't know about, I'm not a string theory expert, but at least according to them, it's too complicated to solve, but they're at least suggestions that these kinds of objects could arise from string theory. And essentially what, what, they, what they proposed is that for the non-rotating case, that there would be a solution where there's an anti dissider space in the interior and the scale of that, the, the lens scale is set by Planck scale physics. So the microscopic physics determines the, the, the cosmological constant in the interior. Um, there's a shell of essentially stringy matter, various membranes and things that form a shell. Um, and outside um, at Schwarzschild space time, but the interesting thing that they argued is that for this thing to be stable, it's actually going to not sit very close to the horizon, but actually at the Buchdahl radius, so some macroscopic distance outside of R equals 2m. Now, the, the, the interesting, the further interesting thing that they conjectured is that for large black hole, black, black bubbles, so where the radius of the black hole is very large relative to the length scale set by the interior cosmological constant, that the, if the, the stringy matter that makes up the shell has an effectively a classical description and the space-time geometry is effectively described by Einstein gravity. So in that case, um, in that limit to a very good approximation, purely classical physics should be able to describe this bubble. And they, they, they said that, the, that in this limit, this shell is actually composed of three main constituents that are well approximated by ideal fluids. In fact, it's actually two two main constituents for the large black bubble case, one a relativistic gas, the other a membrane. And this is, there's a subdominant stiff gas component. Um, so, so the, this bubble is composed of sort of a multi-component fluid in the classical limit. Um, and an important part for the stability, which I'll mention a bit later on, um, was that this, the shell is sitting, it's a hot, so, well, relatively speaking, it's hot, but it's at the local unroot temperature of an, an observer that's sitting um, outside the shell, the acceleration temperature of such an observer. It's actually, it's, it's very cold for, for large black holes, but um, um, the gas is at the unroot temperature. And in fact, the entropy of the gas at this temperature is very close to that of, of the entropy of a would-be black hole of the same mass. So in that sense that this, they argue that these actually are alternatives to black holes and not just a new class of compact object that, that arises from string theory, um, because the, the, this then would be, in some sense, their solution to the information loss problem that black holes actually don't form in string theory, but these black bubbles form. In fact, how they, so they, what they argue here, again, they don't, they don't show that, but they argued, and this really is a quantum mechanical process, but the formation process would be um, essentially through quantum mechanical tunneling. So, the entropy of these black bubbles is very, very large. Ordinary matter is very low entropy. And if ordinary matter is collapsing so that a horizon would form, then quantum mechanically, because of this large entropy disparity, it's almost inevitable that, that the, whatever ordinary matter is there will quantum mechanically tunnel to a black bubble. Um, but then once a black bubble is formed, it's essentially to be described well by classical physics. But another reason why this is a good black hole mimicker is because of the large entropy of the matter on the shell, when additional matter falls into one of these black bubbles, it's not like, it's not like for instance, when matter accretes onto a neutron star, there's, there's gonna be a, a large flare and it will be very obvious, there'll be a hot spot on the neutron star. But in fact, because of the large entropy, uh, any matter that falls on this bubble will essentially be absorbed 
almost instantaneously from an external observer's perspective. Um, and so it will essentially wink out, not at infinite redshift, at a finite redshift by the, set by the Buchdahl radius, but this object will essentially look like a black hole that's close to the walking temperature. So it will, for all intents and purposes, look like a black object. Okay, so they've essentially, they, they put their conjecture on the line by allowing it to be treated uh, by, by classical physics, which means that we can actually start addressing the question of, are these classically stable? You know, it's as interesting as an idea as it is, if it's not classically stable, then, 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 this, then it's, it's not a viable um, alternative. And so what, what they argued is, um, they, at least they did this quasi-stationary analysis and showed that in fact, this, uh, these black holes were stable. And a crucial part of it was um, that between these, that there's an internal interaction that happens between the various constituents, in particular between the gas and the membrane. Um, so an internal flux that operates between them, reacting to perturbations, always keep the shell at the local unroom temperature. And that component was essential then. And essentially what, what it essentially does is if, if the black bubble compresses, the temperature goes up, so the pressure has to go up to push it back out and vice versa on the opposite side. So this internal flux that maintained it at the unroom temperature, at least in the quasi-stationary case, was able to, um, they argued, was able to make these bubbles classically stable. So this is kind of where um, some of the work that I did now in collaboration with, with Ulf Danielson and Louise Danner is we decided to, to, to go beyond the quasi station limit and actually perturb these bubbles in a dynamical setting and actually go beyond linear perturbations. Um, we were also, one of the other sort of motivations for the, this project was also to, to develop numerical techniques that in principle would work beyond spherical symmetry. So even though this study is purely in spherical symmetry, we wanted to develop techniques that would work beyond spherical symmetry. Um, and as I said, essentially in spherical symmetry, because of sort of Birkhoff's theorems, the fact that there are no gravitating propagating, propagating degrees of freedom, you can get away with, with murder basically and, get, and get, get to answers very quickly. But we didn't want to, we wanted to avoid that as much as possible. We were only partly successful as I'll, I'll describe later in that regard, but that was also one of the motivations for tackling this project. Um, so let me not say too much about, about the numerics and the code. I'll just, just a, a couple of the, these points about um, what we wanted to do to eventually be able to generalize this. One is for the metric ansets. We, we imposed a, a metric, the so-called light-like ansets, which made some of the numerics more difficult than what it could have been. But the reason was so that, so it's essentially that the, the radial, the RT, the radial time sector is conformal to Minkowski space. And effectively what happens then with the Einstein equations is that the, these B and C metric functions satisfy wave equations. So the, the, so the structure of the evolution equations with this metric ansatz is in some spirit very much like the typical hyperbolic schemes used in general without symmetry constraints. And then we also made sure to not of apply the Israel junction conditions as boundary conditions, which they're not fundamentally, but in spherical symmetry, you can often do that. But we essentially integrated the, the Einstein equations with the distributional source sort of ab initio. Um, and of course it's consistent with the junction conditions, but we didn't actually impose them. Oh yeah, and we also, um, the, the, the original fluid description didn't have dissipation, but in that case, even for stable bubbles, if you perturb them, they'll oscillate forever. Yeah, we wanted to actually have it settle down to a stationary eight, so we added dissipation to the fluid. Okay, so, the, so let, me, let me explain this internal flux, um, um, how we implemented this in the dynamical situation, because then I'll sort of explain the first answer that we got for this, this original flux proposal, the way that we implemented this in, in this dynamical case turned out not to be stable. And then that will also explain how we kind of in a ad hoc way fixed it. So the, the main requirement was that there's an internal flux between the, the, the gas and the membrane components to always keep the shell at the under temperature. And it's the gas that, that's dominating the entropy. And so it's really the, the, the temperature of the gas that we're concerned with. So if we require the gas to be at the, the under temperature, then well, if it's a thermodynamic sort of a three-dimensional gas sort of, you know, confined to a shell, uh, the, the energy density scales the temperature cubed. 
Therefore, the fractional change in energy density um, is related to the change in temperature, which we can then relate to the change in the proper acceleration outside the shell. So this is the relationship that we want to impose. On the other hand, this being a classical ideal gas, it has, it's subject to the Euler equations, which in some sense don't care about the temperature. And that's what I've written here on this line. So this says that the change in the, 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 the energy density of the gas is proportional to the fractional change um, in the area of the gas given by this function f. And these two equations, we can't impose them simultaneously. And generically, they're not going to be consistent. So what we do is add a flux to this equation, the Euler equation, such that we essentially exactly get the, this, this temperature constraint. So basically, the, 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 the factor of f that appears here is we're basically throwing away the Euler equation and replacing it with this, this temperature constraint. And to be, fully, to be in, in all self-consistent, um, the energy uh, that, that does this, or the way where the energy, the source of energy for this flux comes from the membrane. So we add this as a source to the, the gas component. We subtract this as a source from the membrane. So the net energy of the gas doesn't change. It's a pure internal reaction uh, that it can maintain this, this um, relationship. Okay, so when we, we, we tried this and you know, we, we, were, uh, we, were, we, we, we were stumped for a long time because nothing that we did, none of the parameters we tried uh, could get stable bubbles. And in fact, they're wildly unstable with this prescription. Um, it's not just that they, they stay around for a while and then collapse, but essentially every case we looked at, they form, the bubble either explodes or it collapses to a black hole in the light crossing time. And here's for example, one example. So we take um, a bubble initially normalized, you know, it's at the Buchthal radius, but you're normalized to its initial radius. Here we give it a small scalar field of perturbation uh, where it gains one one thousandth of its mass, and here it collapses essentially in a light crossing time to, to a black hole. Um, just to, to illustrate the, the simulation, so here's an example of this is this example with a scalar field. So here the, on the horizontal axis, it's our coordinate x-axis, which we map to the, the radial coordinate in, in a, in a non-trivial way, but in a way that the, the coordinate radius of the shell remains fixed. The outer boundary here is at quite a large distance. This sort of Gaussian pulse of scalar field is time symmetric. So when I play the animation, part of it is going to go towards the bubble. We're going to accrete all of that onto the bubble. And part of it is just going to move away. But it's the accreting part which perturbs the bubble. So you can see here the scalar field evolves. There it's, it's accreted onto the black hole. It's the exterior is settling down. Of course, here on this movie, we can't see anything happening in terms of the location because the bubble's at a fixed location. But monitoring the proper area of the bubble, the aerial radius, it does collapse to a black hole. Just to, just to illustrate to the, the, the fact that we actually are evolving a discontinuous metric at the location of the shell bubble. It has to be discontinuous because of the distributional matter. But just for example, on the left is a, a, the, the B and the C metric functions. The top line is B, the bottom one is C. I don't worry too much about what they mean, but this is much more to illustrate that we are stably evolving um, these distributional matter sources. Then not, not too much interesting happens here until it actually collapses to a black hole. Um, but on the right-hand side, I'm showing the time derivatives of these. So the left-hand side, it's, they discontinuous. Sorry, they, they, they smooth but non-differentiable. And the right with the time derivatives, they actually are discontinuous. Here you can see the gauge waves propagating. So you can see within a, you know, essentially one light crossing time of these gauge waves things uh, trapped surface forms. Okay, so uh, what, was, what was wrong with the original quasi-stationary analysis? Um, and just to illustrate, um, uh, this is essentially, they, they, they missed an important part that, that, that comes up when there's dynamics. So, this is uh, the proper acceleration of a state of an observer, not necessarily stationary, but the proper acceleration of, of an observer now here in Schwarzschild coordinates for simplicity. So the usual Schwarzschild form of the metric. And you can see the, the, the essentially the aerial velocity and aerial acceleration, capital A, shows up in this expression. And what the quasi-stationary analysis effectively did, did was drop those A and V terms. The V term is not too relevant. It's really this A term, which is, which is the, the problematic case. And it turns out that, look, of course, 
the, the gradient of f with respect to r is a constant sign, but the acceleration, this capital A term, can have an arbitrary sign depending on the acceleration. And in fact, it's such that with a typical case where we start with a stable black bubble and then perturb it, it's, almost, it's always got the wrong sign. And so this, this dynamical acceleration term uh, completely counteracts the stabilizing effect of, of what the flux was designed to do. So we kind of invented a kind of an ad hoc fix whereby by asking, well, what locally can the material on the bubble respond to to trigger this flux? Well, at least in this model, the spherically symmetric case, it can only respond to local changes in the acceleration or to local changes in the, the, the area element, the local volume of the shell. So we generalize the flux prescription by putting in these arbitrary uh, constant parameters. Again, okay, so this, this is ad hoc. We, we don't have, or Ulf doesn't have string theory arguments to suggest why this might have to be modified, but at least, um, we try to sort of salvage this model by, by doing this. And now we can actually find regions of alpha and beta parameter space where this, 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 these bubbles are stable. But one problem, um, and this is now getting back to where I mentioned, um, you know, we wanted to develop a code which was easily generalizable beyond spherical symmetry, but this is one, one place where we failed. And the reason turns out to be, so one, once we've, we generalized this, we actually did a proper or a more thorough linear stability analysis and noticed um, that well, we, we couldn't find any set of constant parameters that work for all size bubbles. So the, the, there's a new scale that's involved, this, this ADS length scale. And it turns out that small bubbles behave very differently compared to large bubbles um, um, in, in this model. And it's easy to stabilize small bubbles at the expense of large bubbles and vice versa. We haven't yet been able to find parameters where it can work in both cases. But the large bubbles are the ones that are relevant for astrophysical applications. But our non our PDE code uh, cannot doesn't work well very well when the cosmological constant inside becomes large. So we can't actually study the large bubble case effectively. So just to figure out, well, is this model worth pursuing more? We need to know if the large bubbles are stable. So we cut corners and that come up. We did use the Israel disjunction conditions as boundary conditions in a in a separate ODE model where we could look at nonlinear perturbations, but essentially just restricted to the bubble and do a more efficient uh, study of parameter space. Um, and one interesting, or interesting one, one additional benefit to having two parameters, is we actually found regions in this alpha beta parameter space where we could stabilize bubbles, which means we could then um, use, a, use one of these parameters to add features to the end state. So what we found was with um, just, just picking some region in this parameter space where things were stable, um, that typically after a perturbation, the bubble would gain mass, but it would evolve to a new radius that was not at the new Buchdahl radius. So if that seems to be a, a feature that string theory is saying is important, that might be something that we want to put in this, this, uh, this model. And in fact, we can do that. We can therefore add an additional constraint where uh, after a perturbation, it does settle down, at least in the linear case, to a new, a new uh, Buchdahl state. And here's an example um, of, of, of such of a result from, from that, that ODE-based code. Um, so this shows that the fractional, or the evolution of the radius as a fractional deviation from its instantaneous Buchdahl radius. The so zero would be if it's sitting at the Buchdahl radius. Um, and yet just for, you know, for interest, we perturbed the shell twice with identical perturbations. And just notice that the x-axis here is a logarithmic scaling proper time. So it's actually identical perturbations. It just looks very sharp at this later one because of the logarithmic scale. So we perturbed it a second time before it was even settled into its final state. So a pretty large black hole relative to the internal length scale. This first set of parameters gives stable bubbles but as you can clearly see, it doesn't settle down to a new Buchdahl state. But then using this relationship, uh, here's a second example of stable parameters where at least to linear order it does settle down to a new Buchdahl state. Okay, so um, that, 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 that's sort of the end of my, my talk. And I think, only, sorry, I did go a few minutes over, but just, just to conclude so the first, the, the broader picture, um, I think we, we, the era of gravitational wave observation of the universe has arrived. And you know, if, 
I think if, if we all expect general relativity is correct, we're definitely going to learn a lot about compact objects in the universe. Um, at the same time, we're now seeing a, a regime of, of gravity that's never been explored or tested before in labs on Earth or, or through other means. And so this is really the first direct window into to, to testing strong field relativity. That means that this, this slew of alternative theories, exotic alternatives that, that have been suggested you know, even before these gravitational wave observations, um, they, they now, um, they, they have actual data that they, that they have to confront if they want to still remain viable going forwards. And so and that, that, as I hopefully outlined, that's actually a difficult problem to establish that they're uh, well we have unstable, but essentially um, we now have data to, put, to com compare with these theories. And then, okay, and why, 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 why is it so difficult coming up with these, with these alternatives that are you know, interesting and viable in the way that I've said? And you know, it, it might be that general relativity actually is so unique that there aren't that many options. Um, but you know, I think we, we, we need to look a little bit harder at some of these alternatives and try to make them viable so that we can uh, contra or, you know, expose them to the data. And at least so far, it looks like ADS black bubbles, even though we had to do some ad hoc tuning to the model, that's at least survived the spherically symmetric stability test. So um, I think there's some promise in this as being a, a model that could be confronted with full data eventually. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for your time.